Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Mikhail Suss, and I'm an attorney with Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, a nonpartisan government watchdog group. We filed a written comment along with the ACLU of Georgia, Common Cause Georgia, and the Public Rights Project, urging the board not to adopt the proposed rule defining election certification because it is contrary to settled Georgia law and it would exceed this board's rulemaking authority. Today, I wanna make three key points. First, when this board adopts rules, it is not writing on a blank slate. Instead, the board has to stay strictly within the bounds of both the statutory law passed by the legislature and the case law of the Georgia Supreme Court. And I wanna stress the case law today because in its discussions of this proposed rule and other rules relating to certification, the board has not meaningfully addressed a long line of Georgia Supreme Court cases that make clear county certification is a non-discretionary act and further, that the powers of county superintendents are limited and strictly regulated by statute. Those Supreme Court cases are binding on this board and must be considered in this rulemaking under the Georgia Administrative Procedure Act. Each case is cited at page four of our written comment. Second, the legislature has outlined in painstaking detail the powers and duties of election superintendents, and yet no statute, none, gives county superintendents any power to conduct a free roaming, quote, reasonable inquiry of the election as a condition of certification as this proposed rule would. And that omission is noteworthy because other parts of the election code do expressly give a limited amount of discretion to the superintendent. And by the superintendent, I mean a voting majority of the county election board, not the individual members of the board. I'll give you two examples. Georgia Code Section 212-493B says that when the superintendent discovers an apparent numerical discrepancy in the vote totals from a precinct, the superintendent may order a recount or recanvas of votes, quote, if the superintendent deems it necessary. That is a clear, limited grant of discretion. Even clearer is the next section of the statute, section 21 to 493C. That says that if the superintendent identifies a numerical discrepancy in a precinct using paper ballots, the superintendent may require production of the ballot box and a recount of the ballots, quote, in the discretion of the superintendent. So this clear language shows that when the legislature wants to give superintendent discretion, it does so expressly. And yet the legislature chose not to use that language with respect to county certification. To the contrary, section 21-2-493K commands that certification, sh quote, shall occur by a hard deadline with no room for discretion. And the election code provides robust procedures outside of certification for addressing suspected fraud or error through the proper channels. To be clear, the proposed rule identifies no basis in Georgia, Georgia law for the phrase reasonable inquiry because there is none. Those words do not appear in either of the statutes that are cited as authority for this proposed rule, and they don't appear in any other part of the election code. The proposed rule says it's based on guidance by the US Election Assistance Commission, but if you read that guidance, it does not include the words reasonable inquiry. I will be linked the actual guidance in our comment, and I urge you to read it because it does not actually contain those words nor does the guidance claim to offer a universal definition of uh, certification for all 50 states. To the contrary, it recognizes that the certification process is defined by state law. And here it is Georgia law that this board must follow. Because the legislature has not explicitly empowered county superintendents to conduct a quote reasonable inquiry as a condition of certification, the board has no authority to grant that power itself. Adopting this rule would unconstitutionally usurp the legislature's power to regulate elections. Third and finally, adopting this rule would not fulfill this board's statutory duty to promote quote, uniformity in the practices and proceedings of superintendents, nor would it achieve the, the rule's stated purpose to quote, establish clear standardized criteria for certification. It will do the exact opposite. Uh, as, as many have already said today, the word reasonable is inherently subjective. Uh, Georgia has 159 counties. What's reasonable to board members in one county may not be reasonable to members in another county, or individual board members in the same county may disagree on what's reasonable. This sort of open-ended language invites arbitrary and patchwork decision-making across counties, and it gives election workers no advance notice of what a particular board member may wanna do or what documents they may wanna see before they certify. This could impose significant burdens in the hectic week between election day and certification. 
So in closing, the proposed rule is contrary to settled Georgia law. It would exceed the board's rulemaking authority, and it would not withstand judicial review. We urge the board not to adopt the proposed rule. Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions the board may have. So basically, what you're saying is that when it comes to certifying the board, it's just a prop. No, that is not what I'm saying. Uh, I, I identified two very specific areas in the law that do give a limited amount of discretion to the county superintendent. That is the voting majority of the full board. They do have limited amount of discretion to conduct a recount or recanvas if there is a numerical discrepancy in the vote totals from a precinct. So no, they're not just pure functionaries. The legislature has spelled out in detail in the election code the areas where the legislature has dictated the superintendent can exercise a certain amount of discretion, but it is narrowly limited by statute. And that's consistent with over 100 years of case law from the Georgia Supreme Court that has said that the duties of superintendents are ministerial. And I feel I feel like it's important to define that word ministerial. We kind of we throw around that term. Yeah, let's define ministerial. What does that mean? So it, it refers to a duty that is strictly defined by statute. It doesn't mean that the person doesn't have any power. It just means that the legislature has to spell out in detail how they exercise that power. So in other words, the statute in both of these uh, situations with recounts and re and recanvases it says, you know, it, it's almost like a like a flow chart or an if then statement. It's like if there is a numerical discrepancy in the vote totals from the precinct, then the superintendent shall have, you know, Y authority and they may do certain things. So they're all clearly spelled out in statute like a checklist. That's how this works. It's not a broad grant of discretion. The superintendents, whether in Georgia or in any other state in the country, frankly, are not just given you know broad ranging authority to check the election results as a whole and sign off on the election results as a whole. The legislature has carved out a very specific role for them, and they have to play that role and they have to stay in their lane in order for the election to run on time. I think it's the stay in the lane that's that's a lot for me, um, and the reason why is because I feel like their lane is to sign up. To sign the document that says that the, what, what, what's before them is accurate and is correct. And basically what you're saying is if you can't determine accuracy within the rules that we've set for you, then you just have to certify. So their oath is to follow Georgia law. And Georgia law spells out these specific tools that they have to address certain uh, irregularities and numerical discrepancies. And so they do have some power and are able to exercise that power within the uh, parameters of the election code. Uh, but their oath, the oath that they take, the affidavit they sign, all, it doesn't give them any more authority than Georgia law provides. It doesn't give them some sort of extra statutory authority. Their authority is strictly defined by the statute. The affidavit is not a statute. Their oath is not a statute. The statute is the statute, and the, and the legislature has spoken. Uh, and again, the legislature knows how to give them discretion, and it chose not to give them discretion over certification. And if this board were to do that, it would be taking over the role of the legislature and and uh, overriding the, the role of the courts as well. So you're basically saying that the board has the right to do additional research within the, the allotted time that they have to certify. You're saying that's creating a law? I'm saying that adopting a rule that's inconsistent with the statute and over 100 years of Georgia Supreme Court precedent is outside of this board's authority. This board is bound by the precedent of the courts, and it's bound by the uh, uh, statutory law passed by the legislature. And I'm saying that this rule, re this reasonable inquiry language, has no basis in Georgia law. And, and, and frankly, it doesn't have any basis in the EAC guidance either, because the, that language is not in the guidance. Uh, so it, it doesn't really have any basis in law, period. I'm, I'm going to wait for the rebuttal, and then I'll. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't know your name. Uh, Nikhil Suss. Nikhil Suss. Mr. Suss? Yes. Yes, Mr. Suss. Um, I, I've also, you, you said you've never seen reasonable inquiry as a word, as, as two words, um, nor do I see free roaming anywhere in the statute that you just alluded to, that reasonable inquiry is the same, equivalent to free roaming. I don't think so. Uh, and you say if if the board finds a discrepancy, well, how in the world will, will a board find a discrepancy um, if it is not allowed to discover, as you said, if it discovers? If, if you're asked to discover, that means a review of the election documents or the numbers or the, the vote tallies or the counts. So 
what, what would you expect the board to do to just sit there and wait for some numbers to be delivered to them? So and I, I can read from the statute for you 21 to 493B. It says the superintendent, again, that's the voting majority of the board, before computing the votes in any precinct shall compare the registration figure with the certificates returned by the poll officers, showing the number of pers persons who voted in each precinct or the number of ballots cast. If upon consideration by the superintendent of the returns and certificates before him, him or her from any precinct, it shall appear that the vote total return for any candidate or candidates for the same office or nomination or any question exceeds the number of electors in such precinct or exceeds the total number of persons who vote in such precinct or the total number of ballots cast therein, such excess shall be deemed a discrepancy and palpable error and shall be investigated by the superintendent. Uh, I'm skipping a bit here and it says such excess shall authorize summoning of the poll officers to immediately appear with any primary or election papers in their possession. The superintendent shall then examine the registration uh, and primary or election documents, whatever, relating to such precinct in the present presence of representatives of each party, body, and interested candidate. So, and I can read on, but the process is laid out in the law. It's not a free roaming inquiry. It's not a reasonable inquiry. It is the inquiry provided by law. And all we are saying is that, that this is what the statutes already say. By adopting uh, this term reasonable in inquiry, this undefined term, you're introducing vagueness into the law. And when the law actually lays out the process here and the legislature has not given you authority to do that. If you were to do that, it would be in excess of the board's rulemaking authority. The code instructs the, uh, the superintendent, the board to compute, tabulate and certify. So they are involved And in what you just described sounds like the very definition of reasonable inquiry. Sure. Somebody may say that, but somebody else may say, well, reasonable inquiry is I want to look at different types of documents and I want to look at different things other than the registration papers and the documents from the poll officers. And there would be no guardrails to stop that because the rule doesn't define reasonable inquiry. So you're introducing vagueness when it's not really necessary because the law already spells out the process in detail. I think the Board of Elections should be able to see every single election document in the office. So, Dr. Johnson, I, I just want to be clear. I'm not telling you my policy, my policy views right now. I'm telling you what the law says. And the legislature has passed law, and you are bound by that law. And the Georgia Supreme Court has decided cases, and you are bound by those cases. You have no discretion. This board doesn't have any discretion to override the decisions of the courts or the statutory law passed by the legislature. And so we could talk about the policy and w whether the policy is a good idea or not, but it's not up to any of us in this room right now making that decision. It's up to the legislature, and it's up to the courts. I don't, I don't think um, our code states that ele um, election boards, superintendents, can see only these documents and not see these other election documents. If you could point that out to me in the code book, please do. I'm not sure what, what documents are you talking, specifically what documents are you talking about? Well, you just suggested that the, um, the um, legislature said that only certain documents were available for superin superintendents. So I'm saying that the law spells out a certain procedure. That was one, one example of a procedure for a recount or recanvas, where it does give a limited amount of discretion to the superintendent. Those are the documents that they specify, but it also says the superintendent shall examine all registration and primary or election documents, whatever relating to such precinct. So those are the documents that the poll officers bring. Those are the documents that they have. I mean, that's presumably the, do the documents that are in the possession of the precinct, in, in possession of the poll officer. That's a fairly expansive universe of documents, but they're in the code. They're written in the code. Uh, and that authority to, to access those documents is contingent on there being a discrepancy. There has to be a discrepancy first, and the superintendent has to identify it. And again, this, you may disagree with me, but this is just what the law says. I'm just reading the, the statute, uh, and that is how the law is laid out. Mr. Heakin. Uh, if I may. Certainly. Mr. Chair, Absolutely. I'm dying of curiosity to hear about 100 years of Florida Supreme Court precedents. Georgia? Can you name a few cases? Sure. Georgia. Sure. Name one, because I read, your, I read your brief, and it was pretty thin gruel. Okay. So, 
So Tanner versus Dean, 33 SE 832, Georgia Supreme Court, 1899. The court ordered the Democratic superintendents in Coffee County uh, to consolidate election returns, including returns that had been improperly excluded from a particular precinct, from the McDonald precinct, because the superintendents, I'm reading the facts of the case right now, because the superintendents were duties were, quote, regulated by statute and not left to the discretion of the party performing them. Davis versus Ward, 1118 SE 378, Georgia Supreme Court, 1923, 1923. The court held that county canvassers had no authority to reopen and recertify a previously certified canvas to exclude the votes of women who hadn't paid a poll tax. The court said the duties of canvassers are purely ministerial. They perform the mathematical act of tabulating the votes of the different precincts as the returns come to them. Bacon versus Black, 133 SE 251, Georgia Supreme Court, 1926. The court held that election superintendents could not refuse to count votes based on allegations of fraud in a sheriff's election because, quote, the duties of the managers or superintendents of election who are required by law to assemble at the courthouse and consolidate the votes of the county are purely ministerial. One more case, Thompson versus Talmadge, 41 SE2D, 883, Georgia Supreme Court, 1947. And this resolved the uh, famous uh, three governors controversy. The court held that the General Assembly exceeded its authority in canvassing uh, a governor's election by making a factual finding that the winning candidate had died uh, after the election and by certifying the election for a different candidate. The court explained, quote, the General Assembly as canvassers of the election returns in this case were subject to the general, if not universal rule of law applicable to election canvassers. That rule is that they are given no discretionary power except to determine if the returns in proper form and executed by the proper officials and to pr pronounce the mathematical result unless additional authority is expressed. So those are four cases right there. Those are uh, just a few examples, but I can. Uh, so what, uh, what interplay between separation of powers was uh, in effect in Thompson versus Talmadge? Uh, I'm not sure how that's relevant to the issue of county certification. That's what it, it was a separation of powers case between the powers of the judiciary and the powers of the general assembly. Okay. Well, I, the only relevance of the separation of powers here is the fact that this board doesn't have the authority to grant county superintendents a power that the legislature has not granted itself. That would be a violation of the separation of powers. Are you saying the legislators do not expect the counties to produce accurate and correct information when they certify? So. I, I can't read the legislature's mind, but I can read the books. I, mean, I can read the statutory like books. I can, I can read, well, no, I can read the law that they put on paper. That's that's how it works. So you, according to the law, yes. does it say that the county uh, representatives have to sign a, a legal document stating that their information is accurate? Does it say in your, in your law, but in the law, that they have to do that even if it's inaccurate? It's a loaded, there's a lot going on in that question. Well, I mean, if it, you're, there's a lot going on in that question. We're not, we're not going through all of that. We're just looking at what you, what's on your paper in the law. Like, so the law say that? I'm telling you that, so all these cases I read to you, right? That's the law in Georgia. That's Georgia law. That's, I, that's just a, I'm a specific question. I, okay. Well, I'm saying that the legislature legislated against the backdrop of this law. So this is Georgia law. And these are the principles that guide uh, all the uh, enactments that are, uh, uh, adopted by the legislature. The legislature has has put on the page no grant of discretion with respect to county certification, and it has left intact this case law over 100 years of Georgia Supreme Court precedent. This is the law in Georgia, and what it says is that county superintendents don't have express authority to do anything unless the legislature explicitly gives it to them. So you're sort of flipping the, the hypothetical. You're saying, oh, does, did the legislature say that they can't do it? But that's Don't the exact opposite way to look at it. Okay, that's first, the exact opposite way to look at it. I'm not flipping anything. I'm asking a direct question, sure. number one. But number two, mm -hmm. because here's my concern. My concern is that you, you you throw the law into it to protect you and your interests or whatever. Let me Let me just finish. And whatever you believe or whatever you think is right. However, there's no law that protects him because he has to sign this document saying it's accurate. And if it's not accurate, for whatever reason, it will fall back on him. And then the county would then have to provide him with legal support, correct? 
he has to attest that he performed his duties under state law. I'm not aware of any election superintendents being prosecuted at any time for as incorrectly man. incorrectly certifying an election. If, you, if if that is something that has happened routinely in Georgia, uh, uh, you could let me know. But what I'm saying is that attorney, so they're I'm not going to debate that. I'm not understood. And I, and I don't mean to talk over you. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, but I, I will just say that they are attesting that they perform their duties under Georgia law and Georgia law strictly limits their duties. And you were saying, what you were saying is if there's discrepancies as far as the count, then they have to do a recount and you went through that whole process. Now, if there's discrepancies that's not necessarily related to the count, then what's the law say? So it's like a football team and everybody's got to perform their role. There are certain functions like investigating uh, fraud that may require a court to resolve it and may require an election contest. Uh, there, there may, there needs to be an adversarial hearing where there's rules of evidence that apply and witnesses come in, and so that is not the county and superintendent's job. They, they, they are not charged with, you know, if, we, if we're on a football team and they're the center, their job is snapping the ball. It's not to, you know, run wide, wide receiver and try to catch the ball and play all these different positions. Everybody has to stay in their lane and do their jobs. And there are certain things. Again, uh, I don't want to oversimplify the duties of county superintendents. I do think that they do have they have a very important job, very important job. And this, the legislature has outlined what they're supposed to do, but it has not given this sort of open ended grant of discretion. And there are other people involved in the process that are in charge of resolving those sorts of issues. And importantly, uh, with respect to election contests, election contests can't even start until the county uh, superintendents certify. And so by refusing certification, by withholding certification, they're actually obstructing the lawful process, the process that the legislature has designated for these issues to be resolved. Not withholding certification. Uh, well, I'm just saying, I'm not saying anybody has done that. Certify within the allotted time frame, correct? You're still certified. No, no one's withholding certification. That's number it, one. There has been many instances throughout the country of people withholding certification over the yeah, past I, four I'm years. I'm talking about this particular rule. This particular rule has had some, it's, there's no way that it would uphold certification because they still have to certify within the allotted time. So that's number one. But number two, the point I'm making is that you continue to say things like they have an important role that what they have, you know, we're not stripping them of their power or they still have their power, but then in the same breath, you say they need to stay in line, be a team player, do what they basically do what we're telling you to do, regardless of whether you feel comfortable doing it. That makes that's that's where that ministerial is a problem for me. Because you don't get to tell people to sign a legal document. And I, I'm not an attorney, but I am a business owner. And at no point in time do you tell me to sign a legal document that I'm uncomfortable with and then demand that I stand behind it as if I am comfortable with it. So performing, so performing your duties in accordance with state law would be in full compliance with that document. Nobody's violating a document if they simply do what the law says that they're supposed to do. That that that's clear. But I, we can disagree about what is the best sort of process for this. I'm not here to take a view on that. I'm just telling you what the cases say and what the statutes say. That's it. I appreciate. It. So, Thank Mr. You. Mr. Suss, you said in one of the cases you presented that proper forms and proper counts would then um, lead to certification. So you did in that case actually confirms that the proper forms should be um, reviewed, not improper. So, so the, the superintendent should make sure that the forms are proper and the counts are proper. So, um, and, and reasonable inquiry should ensure that the information, the, that's, those are the election documents regarding the claimed subject matter, the vote counts, is consistent. That's all that the superintendent should be doing. Um, if there's no inquiry, it makes a farce of the election. So, Dr. Johnson, if you were to memorialize something that specific into a proposed rule, and it were actually, and if it were consistent with the case law and the statute, that would be fine. And I understand that you're you're interpreting reasonable inquiry in that way, and I don't take issue with that. What I do take issue with is adopting something so broad that it could be misinterpreted by others or misapplied by others because the term reasonable is so subjective and so subject. And especially since, you know, there's no time to sort of test out this rule before the election, like this is it. So you'd be throwing it in for the first time and seeing how it plays out and the results could be pretty bad. 
And why not just come up with a better uh, uh, framework here? I mean, the chairman has withdrawn his rule, but he had a rule that actually outlined some documents that the uh, county board members would be entitled or county board would be entitled to see before certification. There are there are other rules that this board could adopt that don't invite that sort of problematic inquiry. Uh, it's just this sort of language, uh, especially given the context where the legislature and the, and the courts have said uh, superintendents have, you know, very limited, strictly regulated stat uh, statutory duties and obligations. Uh, this this rule simply doesn't uh, conform with that case law. Thank you, Mr. Sis. Thank you. We appreciate that.